Uh, anybody here in the van ever been down to Aberdeen, Washington? No. No? Okay. Well, for your information, Aberdeen is located about 100 miles southwest of here on the way to the ocean. Now, Aberdeen used to be known for only two things, the amount of taverns it had and the amount of whorehouses it had. But in Aberdeen lived a young family who had a small son, who by age five was already playing the drums. And by age 12, he was very good on the guitar, and he was getting in and entertaining all of those customers in all those taverns down in Aberdeen. Now, eventually, his notoriety spread up here to Seattle, and then, of course, around the world. And in case you don't know who I'm talking about, I'm talking about Kurt Cobain, who started the band Nirvana. There is this perception still in our country with, with Kurt Cobain is, you know, how did this loser become so big? It's a mystery, isn't it? Load up my guns and bring your friends. It's fun to lose and to pretend. She's overboard. She's in 1994, Kurt Cobain was the biggest rock star on the planet the leader of a world movement called Grunge. And then on April the 5th, he blew his brains out in his greenhouse. Kurt Cobain went to his sub-zero refrigerator, grabbed a Barks root beer, grabbed it in his hand, walked 30 paces, walked into his greenhouse, drank the root beer, injected himself with heroin and shot himself. What motivated him to get him to that point, of course, is the great mystery. In the days leading up to his suicide, Cobain went missing. I went to his hometown of Aberdeen and the city he made famous, Seattle, to retrace the final moments of his life. This is the story of Kurt Cobain's last few days and what happens to a man when he gets what he wants. March the 30th, 1994. At 8.45 a.m., Kurt Cobain leaves his million-dollar mansion in the exclusive Lake Washington neighborhood of Seattle and drives to a part of the city not frequented by the rich and famous. At 9.45, he goes into Stan Baker's Sports at 1000 Lake City Way and buys a gun. This is the gun he would later kill himself with. Just before going to the gun shop, Kurt Cobain had reluctantly agreed to go into rehab to deal with an addiction to heroin chronicled obsessively in his diaries. The hair on the back of my neck is standing up, but particularly when you start reading stuff about his pleas for, to God to help him with his addiction, where he's literally writing, please God, I will do anything. I will trade anything to let go of this addiction. On the afternoon of March the 30th, Harvey Ottinger drove Kurt to the airport to fly to the Exodus Rehab Center in Los Angeles. Basically, it was just a drive from his residence to the airport, which turned out to him going to the rehab facility. And anyway, I pulled into his new home that he'd been in for a couple months and uh, really sat there and waited in the driveway for over an hour. After about an hour, all of a sudden, Kurt just popped into the car sat in, said, well, Kurt, we we're on our way. Harvey had driven Kurt to SeaTac Airport in Seattle numerous times, but this journey was different. Really, very little conversation took place between uh, the drive to the airport, but I got to the airport and pulled up, and he just looked at me and said, oh, F, you know, and, and proceeded to tell me that he had just bought a shotgun and a box of shells this morning and uh, that he still had the box of 20-gauge shotgun shells in his carry-on bag, and of course he couldn't take those into the airport. And he gave them to me and asked for me to return them to the house. He really, he was quite adamant and mentioned several times that he wanted those returned. Did you not think that was a bit unusual? Well, that he had bought, gave me this box. Oh yeah, yeah, I was surprised. I told a few people during the week, 
but nobody thought anything of it. This is the Wild West here. <laughs> when Kurt left Seattle that Thursday evening, it set in motion a chain of events that would result in the discovery of his body just a week later. Well, there's some crazy things in those last few days. There are people that are literally missing Kurt by inches. You know, it's almost a Keystone Cops comedy if it didn't end in such a tragedy. Um, but could any of them saved his life if they would have seen him? And maybe they could have tied him down and locked him up and maybe he would have gotten better. But again, it almost again goes to a spiritual question where you say, what was this man's fate? Aberdeen, Washington, 1967. I had a really good childhood until my parents divorced. I was ashamed of my parents. I couldn't face some of my friends at school. I desperately wanted to have, you know, typical family. I wanted that security. And all of a sudden, my whole world changed. It became antisocial. I started to understand the reality of my surroundings, which is which didn't have a lot to offer. Aberdeen is a small logging town in Washington State on the Pacific Northwest side of America. The nearest city is Seattle, 100 miles away on Interstate 5. True love will find you in the end You'll find out just who was your friend Every store you would go into would have the TV on really loud and somebody would be sitting there smoking, like there'd be smoke hanging in the air. And it would always be raining. Like, I went to Aberdeen for 10 years before I ever went there when it wasn't raining. And you'd always witness some kind of domestic violence. You have to leave to do anything with yourself. If you stay there, you get sucked into the whole malaise of the place. And, and Leyland, what sort of place is Aberdeen? What sort of place is Aberdeen? If you live up on the hill, you're it. If you live over on the south side or down in the flats, you're, you're crap. Kurt Cobain was definitely not up on the hill. His parents divorced when he was only seven, and in the midst of an unhappy home life, he would often seek refuge at his grandparents' trailer. It must have been very difficult for Kurt to be homeless growing up as a teenager in Aberdeen. Oh, he he, he knew he could come here any time he wanted to. In fact, he, he had a few times. When he wasn't staying with his grandparents, he would often sleep in the Aberdeen library. It was here that he befriended Hillary. Can you remember where you first met Kurt? Um, he was just a student who came into the library. I think sometimes he didn't have a place to stay, so there were days when he spent a lot of time here up in the front. <laughs> used to be a good place to doze, and so, um, and uh, it was warm and dry, and so that had its advantages too. So he didn't just come here to read books? No, I don't think so, no. <laughs> he liked music and wanted to play music, and and almost everyone he played around here said, oh, you're terrible, you'll never, you know, <laughs> you'll never make it to the top. Kurt slept in the library, but he also claimed to have slept under this bridge. It is now the site for Kurt Cobain worship in his hometown, after appearing in one of his later songs. That, that sense of Kurt being homeless, I think he overstated, you know, he told people he lived under a bridge. According to everyone I could talk to in Aberdeen, he never lived under the bridge. He, he was a, a whiny, wimpy guy, and it was cold in Aberdeen. But he did live in squats and in abandoned houses, and in probably, I think, the single most heartbreaking story, he would occasionally go into the hospital he was born in and sleep in the waiting room. And his concept with that was that people would think he was waiting for an injured relative and no one would dare approach a guy in a hospital waiting room and say, get out. At 7.55 p.m., Kurt arrived at this hospital in Los Angeles to begin a 28-day program. 
His counsellor was Niall Stimson. This is the first time Niall has ever spoken about the time they spent together. Exodus is or was at that time a rehabilitation program for people having drug and alcohol problems. And it's where a lot of rock stars have gone through recovery themselves and now they support each other and they stay sober. And they have a, a network where they have special meetings and they all go to, and which actually really works really well for those that want to participate. But I had the feeling that he didn't really want to anything to do with that type of scene. He didn't want to hear about recovery really very much at all. I mean, I don't believe that, in my opinion, he was even really ready to look at his addiction as being an issue. And the last thing he wanted to do was be preached by all these rock gods that had been there, done it. In his diaries, he said that he'd pleaded with God that he'd do anything to get rid of his addiction. But here was his counsellor saying that this was the last thing on his mind. I get the feeling he didn't think that he was a junkie and that he had a legitimate reason and, and he was somewhat different. Bobby Sherman, he was into Bobby Sherman music. You know, Bobby Sherman was like David Cassidy or some of those. He was a teen idol, and uh, and he was into Bobby Sherman music, pop, pop, pop music. You know, I mean, and he was talking, and he, you didn't know if he, he was putting you on. It was a tongue-in-cheek thing, or if he really was. Dave Reed took Kurt into his house during one of the teenagers' periods of homelessness in Aberdeen. Dave became a kind of father figure to Kurt, who was impressed that he used to be in a surf band called the Beachcombers. I had an old bass amp, and uh, he would ask to borrow that, and he, he got a guitar and strung it the other way so he could play left-handed. And he would just sit up there, he'd just be chunking on that guitar all day, just hours and hours, and it would just... Da, 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 and I thought, this guy isn't going to do it. Dave lent Kurt his guitar, and he also took him to Christian group meetings, where he was a counsellor. I was married at the time, and uh, we were like youth group leaders in this Baptist church, South Aberdeen Baptist church. In fact, behind me, at my back, he called me, uh, what is the, on the Simpsons cartoon show, The Neighbor. Nell Flanders. M yeah, he called me Flanders, yeah. And see, I had big glasses then, too. And a mustache, come to think of it, I did <laughs> So, so you you're know the square Christian. Yeah, yeah. Jesus on my head. Yes, I need yes, I need me every The seventeen year old Kurt Cobain was baptized at a ceremony with Dave Reed and his son Jesse. He was baptized at that church. Yeah, 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 he was. Yeah. Kurt was talking about it, and that they, they, you know, he accepted the Lord as the Savior and that kind of stuff, and that, uh, that that had happened. And I said, well, that's good, you know. He identified himself as a Christian for a few weeks, but the fact that he would even do that is in such contrast to this image of Kurt Cobain. He was someone who was searching for something to fill himself up. He was searching his entire life. He was searching, I think, even the moment and the year that he took his own life. Um, this, was, this was somebody who wanted to find the way, and unfortunately, he never found anything that, that truly helped him. It was clear that after only one day in Exodus, here was a man tortured by a much bigger conflict than simply being a junkie. He, he wanted to go back to just making records on a four track, that type of thing. You know, you're this rich rock star, you could basically go away, go anywhere you want to go, and you know, if you don't want to be in the music industry, fine, you know, you could get well. And I said, well, why can't you do that? But on the other side, he just sort of th had that sort of like, well, if I do that, then I, I may never get back. They may forget me, you know, and sort of very torn between I don't want to be a rock star, but I don't want to lose it either. The following day, April the 1st, Kurt jumped over the back wall of Exodus. He just slipped over the wall, which was always, you know, sort of a fascinating thing to all the employees that worked there because 
the door was just down the, down the hallway. You could easily walk out. There were no cameras. There were no guards on the door, and probably nobody would have noticed him missing for 30 minutes anyway. While Kurt was running away from his rehab, his wife Courtney Love was also in L.A., trying to deal with her own addiction problems. She was staying at the Peninsula Hotel in Beverly Hills, undergoing a controversial hotel detox program. Instead of going to see her, Kurt jumps into a cab and heads for the airport. She will not see him again. got together at one party. He knew I had a crush on him, you know, because like his friends told him and I'd just go to his house sometimes and hang out with him and then eventually he finally kissed me and then we started going out. Other than Courtney Love, Kurt Cobain had only ever had one long-term relationship. His first girlfriend, Tracy Marinder. He was skinny and he didn't have a job, but the fact that he liked pets and kids was a big plus because you just kind of felt like the mothering instinct, you know, and some of us have that mothering instinct more than others do. Yes, but then the fact that he did keep more closed-minded about how he felt about things, you know, or he could be real sarcastic sometimes too, as well as funny. But uh, there was that paradox there. Because he, he, I think to a certain extent he liked being mothered, but then he didn't want to be. It just kind of went both ways, you know? And did he talk to you much about growing up in Aberdeen? Just kind of how it was a really rednecky town, and he felt he felt out of place, like he felt like uh, like he just didn't fit in with everyone else, because they wanted to do I don't know. They, I guess he thought that they thought he was weird, you know. And they were all into sports and doing things. And I know he tried wrestling for years. Dad kind of pushed him into it, and he didn't like it at all. He wasn't big on wrestling. No. I was so withdrawn by that time, and I was so antisocial that I was almost insane. You know, I always felt that they would, they would vote me most likely to kill everyone in a high school dance, yeah. you know? Death to everyone is gonna come It makes Jose much more fun I've gotten to that point where I've fantasized about it, but it's, I would always have, I always would have opted for killing myself first. Kurt did make one friend at high school, Chris Novoselic. Together they formed a band called The Sellouts and played the local taverns of Aberdeen. But Kurt dreamed of bigger things far, far away from the logging town. Looking to escape Aberdeen, Kurt Cobain headed more and more to Seattle, the Emerald City. So, Jake, Seattle does seem to have a dark side. Yes, it does. Did you want me to talk about yeah, the dark yeah. side? Yeah. Well, as you know, Seattle is commonly thought to be the home of... Um, the most notorious serial killers here in the United States. Uh, Ted Bundy comes to mind, also the man I call Green River Gary, which is Gary Ridgway, the Green River serial murder killer here in town. One of the theories is, is we're the uh, last major northwest city in the continental United States. So people that might have problems keep traveling till they hit onto Seattle. We've got the mountains, we've got the forests, we've got hills, we've got valleys. We're not flat like the cornfields of Kansas, for instance. So it makes for a perfect dumping ground for bodies.
Kurt Cobain was drawn to the darkness of Seattle, to a new music scene that was the first thing in his life that made sense. It was loud, angry and chaotic. It was grunge and it fitted him perfectly. These black and white photographs by Charles Peterson, with their aesthetic of blurred limbs, swirling lights and flailing hair, are credited with turning a group of disparate bands into a scene. It was more just about, like, really this unbridled energy that, that we had that we needed to get out. I mean, and that's sort of what, like, going to shows was like for us. It was just this youthful energy. And it, it made me feel whole. It made me feel like a part of something. Tacoma, a blue-collar town on the outskirts of Seattle, was the place to see many of these new bands. Up until then, it had only been known as the hometown of serial killer Ted Bundy. Its Community World Theatre, a former porno cinema, hosted many of the shows, and it was here that Kurt and Chris met drummer Chad Channing. He was surprisingly more quiet than I thought he would be. You know, especially after, you know, seeing him for the first time, the flared crushed velvet pants and the, you know, platform shoes and all. I mean, it, it was almost night and day, you know, very, it was very quiet, kind of, eh, I don't know if I'd say subdued or anything like that. He, you know, he just was a very, very mellow guy. They asked Chad to join their band, which they had just renamed Nirvana after Kurt saw a late night cable TV program on Buddhism. Do you think, you know, this band is destined for greatness? Um, not particularly, no. Yeah, I, I, I didn't like them the first time I saw them play. The evening of Good Friday, LAX Airport in Los Angeles. At seven minutes past eight, Kurt Cobain bought a first-class ticket to Seattle on Delta Flight 788 purchasing it on his credit card at a cost of $478. He then called Seattle limousines and ordered a car to pick him up at the airport. At 8.43, he tried to withdraw $150, but couldn't. Since buying the plane ticket, his wife, Courtney Love, had discovered that he had run away from Exodus, and so she cancelled his credit card. Kurt ran away from a rehab unit that treated rock stars with drug problems, only to find himself on a plane sitting next to another rock star with a drug problem, Duff McKagan, bass player in Guns N' Roses. Like Kurt, Duff was returning home to Seattle, and like Kurt, he was chronically addicted to heroin. Uh, I think I'd gotten off a tour, and I was flying from L.A. up to Seattle, to home. And I get on the plane, and Kirk gets on the plane and, and sits next to me. And uh, we took off, and, you know, he and I started talking. He had told me, you know, he goes, I just took off from Exodus. We talked, you know, we were drinking, and... I mean, did you talk about any of that heroin addiction on that, that plane journey with Kirk? No, because we... No, we didn't want to... No way. Wasn't an addiction <laughs> on that plane, right? You know, when you're drinking on a plane, you're not going to talk about addiction. But, you know, the classic junkie, heroin junkie thing is, like, you both score. Like, like two, two guys are, get together and, and cop some dope, and then, you know, they're strung out, and you talk about, okay, yeah. We're gonna, we're gonna quit after this. And it's a, the classic, and it, it happens all the time. Yeah, we're gonna quit. That's the only time you really talk about it. Yeah. Delta Flight 788 lands in Seattle at 12.57 a.m. We, we, we got to Seattle, we went to baggage claim, and he was, he was pretty down. And um, uh, a friend of mine, this guy Eddie, met me at baggage claim in Seattle. Kurt and Eddie went out to have a smoke, and, and my friend Eddie came back in. I said, hey, man, you know, maybe we should take him to, over to the house tonight, you know? And we were drinking, you know? So it wasn't a, a, it wasn't a thing like uh, I foresaw anything by any means. But he was down, and he was on his own. 
And uh, so Eddie went back out to, to get Kurt, and right at that moment, his car had picked him up, and he was gone. During 1988, Kurt was spending more and more time in Seattle. That summer, his band Nirvana was signed to a small independent label called Sub Pop. Seattle producer Jack and Dino recorded their first single, Love Buzz, a cover of a song by a Dutch band called Shocking Blue. Sub Pop offered to do a 7-inch for the band, and that became the Love Buzz 7-inch. And we recorded that in summer of 1988. I was, I was pretty excited. I mean, when we first out, uh, found out that uh, they wanted us to do a, a, a single. The very first photographs of the band were taken underneath the Tacoma Bridge by a friend of Kurt's, Alice Wheeler. I don't think I really had anything in mind. It was the first band shoot I ever did, and it was their first shoot, and we were just having fun, I think. I was kind of thinking, wow, this is, this is actually kind of cool. Someone's like taking our photos. It felt, it kind of felt like, you know, almost being in a real band. Now when I look at the photos, I think he's like the prettiest, you know. He just looks so innocent and young, and um, it just seemed like it was a moment in time never to be recreated, you know. I mean, what were your first impressions of him when you first met him? Not strong. Uh, very low-key. Very low-key individual. Polite, low-key. You get the feeling he wouldn't hurt a, you know, wouldn't hurt a flea. Um, but as soon as you heard him sing, as soon as he opened his mouth and started singing, you'd have to go, wow, okay, quite a voice. Something going on here. That was my initial impression was, wow, I like the guitar playing, and he's got an amazing scream. <laughs> what was it? Now, an amazing scream goes a long way in rock and roll. But it wasn't enough for Sub Pop, who at the time were unconvinced by Nirvana. They even rang up Kurt and asked if he could pay the $200 to press his first single. I think that Sub Pop was promoting like Mother Love Bone and like all the popular people that were popular in Seattle. And see, I think that was the difference between Nirvana and Kurt, was even in the Sub Pop crowd, they were sort of considered losers. Good times for a change See, the luck I've had can make a good man turn bad So please, please, please Let me, let me, let me Let me get what I want this time Far, far away in another town by the sea, there was a man who was about to bring Seattle and Nirvana to the world's attention. Now, some say that Everett True is the man that invented grunge. Yeah, Entertainment Weekly said that Everett True is the man who invented grunge. I remember telling that to a taxi driver in Seattle one time and he nearly crashed the cab. I'm like, Jesus, is it that bad? Who was Everett True? Who is Everett True? <laughs> you mean Jerry? <laughs> uh, I met Everett the first time in the Sub Pop offices. And I was like, who is this freak? I got asked to go over to Seattle for the Melody Maker. It was like my first big assignment for them. I was like, I've always wanted to go to America. Send me over there, you know, Seattle. When we flew in, um, it was snowing so hard you couldn't actually see the ground until the wheels of the plane hit the, actually hit the ground. And um, I remember when the city loomed into the into view, thinking this was like the Emerald City, stuck up there, isolated in the Pacific Northwest. Nobody ever came through Seattle because there was no reason to. So the people in Seattle had pretty much just been left to their own devices to develop as they as they wanted. Everett True was to become a close friend of Kurt's. The first time he saw Nirvana, they were playing alongside Skin Yard, Girl Trouble and The Fluid. Yeah, Nirvana sat that night. Um, they had an extra guitarist and I think it was their first show with him, um, Jason Everman, nice fella. Um, but they were trying to be Soundgarden and, you know, they were better off when they were trying to be themselves. And they're just all over the place. I mean, in the early days, 
nobody, you know, anybody who's around Sub Pop um, and who knew any of these bands, nobody ever thought Nirvana were going to be the band to, to break it. Not at all. Um, they, Martani, yes, Soundgarden for sure, you know, um, Tad, yeah, possibly, you know, a bit of a character, um, but definitely not Nirvana. <laughs> On Christmas Eve 1988, Jack and Dino recorded Nirvana's first album at a cost of only $600. Bleach's reviews in America were lukewarm, and it was initially dismissed as an unremarkable heavy metal record. It's not a job with uh, much glamour to it. You're by yourself a lot, and sometimes you get to wonder. You wonder if anyone really cares. Following Bleach's release, Kurt Cobain was broke, and he tried to start up a cleaning business. His longest stint of employment had been as a janitor at his old high school. His new venture, Pine Street Janitorial, failed to take off. Six hours after disappearing from Duff McKagan at Seattle Airport, Kurt was in a cab trying to find somewhere to buy bullets. Nowhere was open, and at 8.30 a.m., the car dropped him off at the Crest Motel trailer park on 145th and Aurora Avenue. Aurora? This place of hookers and junkies and, you know, people turning tricks to get dope, and, and it's, it, like... 20 miles long, and it remained seedy all the way. He would leave a house that, at that point, was worth a couple million dollars, this beautiful mansion on the shores of Lake Washington, or just up from it, and drive to a, a hotel over on Aurora that, at the time, was $18 a night, and not tell anyone he was going there, and just retreat into the shadow world of drugs, addiction, away from the world. And in some ways, I think it was a world he could control. He couldn't control the mansion. He didn't feel like he deserved that. And it was a foreign world, whereas within the world of addiction and drugs in Aurora Avenue, he was protected and insulated from everything. Kurt was often seen at the Crest Trailer Park, as well as the Close Inn. But his favorite place on Aurora Avenue was the Marco Polo. Oh, the old Marco Polo. Yeah. I had a friend of mine staying at a hotel there who was strung out, and he was wanted for murder one. His girlfriend got murdered. He didn't do it. But they thought he did it. And he had stayed, I think it was at the Marco Polo. When so she that was that the up. place to go on Aurora. I guess it was, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, Kurt apparently even had a favorite room, 226. Wasn't that a GBA song? Drugs party in 226? I think it's from 226, Drugs Party in 226. That's probably why. Room 226, Kurt's favorite room at the Marco Polo Motel on Aurora. He was 27, the most successful musician of his generation, married with a two-year-old daughter who he described as a sprouting cherubic joy. But in the last few weeks of his life, he was spending more and more time in 226 shooting up heroin, eating potato chips, and escaping his life. Baby, I know you cannot hear me now Cause you're fast asleep Were you surprised that he got into heroin? The fact that he used to make fun of people that were junkies in Seattle before he became, you know, bigger, that really surprised me that he started doing heroin. He used to make fun of them and talk about what, how lame they were and what a, how stupid they were to do that. So, yeah, I really was pretty surprised. When Kurt Cobain started taking heroin, he didn't see himself as another rock star junkie cliché. He actually believed that he was self-medicating a long-standing stomach problem. I had this stomach condition for like five years, and um, there were times on tour, especially during tour and, and, and while off of tour, where I just 
felt like a drug addict because I was starving and I went to all these different doctors and they couldn't find out what was wrong with me and I tried everything I could think of, you know, nothing worked and I just decided that if I'm going to feel like a junkie every fucking morning and be vomiting every day then I may as well, you know, take a substance that kills that pain. And I can't say that that's the main reason why I did it, but it has a lot to do with it. It has a lot more to do with it than most people think. It does become debilitating being addicted, man. You know, and you can blame it on, on other things. You know, my stomach hurts. Yeah, yeah, I had chronic back pain for three years. The more stuff you do for pain, the more pain you have. And the, the more you need for the pain and the, the more acute your pain becomes, you know. Seattle was awash with heroin, the drug of choice for the rock scene. Kurt Cobain had originally ridiculed this scene, but now wanted to join it, and so he started taking heroin. He then decided to get rid of two people from his life that no longer matched his ambition for Nirvana. Despite their friendship, Chad Channing was fired. Uh, they drove up my driveway, drove all the way from, I think, Olympia at the time and said that they didn't feel things were working out between us and that they, you know, they wanted to look for another drummer and I said that was probably a wise decision. Dave Grohl became the new drummer, a man described as having been raised by wolves in the back of a van. He looked good and he rocked. It is telling that in the very same week he got rid of Chad, Kurt ended his relationship with Tracy. We've been together for three years and just kind of, once we grew a separate ways, because we're still a lot, a lot into the same type of stuff, but I think he was just, maybe he got bored, and I think he also wanted a girlfriend, even though I was supportive, I think he also wanted a girlfriend that could play music or could do more art and stuff. I think that's what he really wanted. I can still picture her now kind of walking towards me, light kind of lighting up her blonde hair like a drunk man's Madonna. I was very excited to meet her because I thought her band were incredible. She was even more excited to meet me because I was like this hotshot name journalist from the UK and Courtney does have a certain fondness for the media, or so I've been told. And so we started talking and we got on brilliantly and next thing I know, we started drinking and next thing I know we're kind of punching each other. Because you do, don't you? You meet someone, you really like their band, you punch them. I mean, it's a sign of affection. And we were rolling around on the floor, and uh, Nirvana walked in, and Kurt sees, it, sees, you know, Everett True rolling around on the floor with this blonde woman, punching each other, most natural thing in the world, to r jump in on top of us and start punching both of us. And that was kind of how they met. They were absolutely blown away by each other, you know, they're perfect for each other, good foils for each other. Um, Kurt certainly wasn't the kind of weak, kind of submissive husband that's been portrayed. Um, you know, they were just, just brilliantly matched. And there's also the other misconception about Courtney is that it was she that got him into the drugs. Absolutely. I mean, you know, Courtney told me, again, an unbelievably chilling story, which really sums it up, and I think way underreported, how she was sober when she met Kurt. She'd been off drugs for almost six months. And she talked to me about the conscious decision she made to go back on drugs, that to be with Kurt meant drugs. And she said she loved him enough that she went back to the drug culture. Kurt Cobain now officially listed as a missing person, this man became part of the story. Courtney Love found my number in the yellow pages and her, Kurt was missing. He took off the day before. And uh, so initially she said she was hiring us to find him. Courtney Love had frantically started searching through the yellow pages for private investigators in LA. Tom Grant just happened to be the first to pick up the phone. 
She also said that he didn't have any money and that she had canceled his credit card. What did Courtney say to you when you left to go to Seattle? She said, save the American icon, Tom, and raised her fists in the air like that. And, and again, Courtney was constantly talking about how suicidal he was. As Courtney is hiring Tom Grant in L.A., Curtis spotted outside the Jack in the Box fast food stand on the corner of Broadway and East Denny in Capitol Hill. Kurt claimed it had the best burgers in Seattle, but it was also just around the corner from his heroin dealer. Load up on guns, bring your friends, it's fun to lose. And to pretend she's all bored and self-assured, oh no, I know, a dirty word. first time, literally the first time I heard Smells Like Teen Spirit, I was with my band staying at somebody's house in the Midwest for listening to mainstream radio, which blew our minds. Like, wow, Kurt's, Kurt's band is on this FM radio station? rock record. It's not a punk record. You could call it a pop record with loud guitars. Alternative rock if you want, but it's essentially classic rock guitar dynamics with Beatlesque pop melodies. Yeah, it captures that sort of we give up quality of, you know, the slacker generation. Uh-huh. Yeah, like like screw you. It smells like teen spirit. Kurt Cobain was going nowhere, and then he wrote this song. With one record, he managed to give voice to a whole generation. It was punk alienation packaged as perfect pop. Nevermind was recorded in April of uh, 1991, and Kurt had, right before the session, been evicted from his apartment in Olympia for not paying his rent. And when he came back from recording a record that was going to change a generation, sell 10 million copies, he had no place to live. He slept in his car. Nirvana had only been picked up by Geffen on the recommendation of their one alternative act, Sonic Youth. And the major label had low expectations for the band's second album, Nevermind originally printing only 50,000 copies. But in just a month after its release, the album had already sold half a million and gone gold. The reason, I think, for Kurt's fame is that there are many people with pain and angst that go through divorced childhoods and go through situations like Kurt. Kurt was able to take that pain that he felt and put it in his songs. These emotions are so universal that people could relate to them and they were touched by this music in the way that they are rarely touched by music and rock. Nevermind got on the charts in the late, you know, late 91. It's climbing the charts. Sometime in early 92, I think it was January, I don't remember exactly, it knocked Michael Jackson off, Michael Jackson off the top of the charts, um, which was fairly stunning. That was what you'd call a, a watershed moment. Um, Suddenly, the major labels, the media, everybody smelled the money. We got a lot of attention, you know what I mean? A lot of, like, Teen Spirit was kind of played into the ground, kind of made me feel a little self-conscious, you know? Um, what do you guys think of Hysteria? Oh, it's a load of shit. I think, I think there are at least 10 to 15 other bands who are just as good, if, if not better, than us. 
and they deserve just as much attention as we do if they choose to take that attention, if they want it. In this spirit, you seem to complain about the apathy of our generation. Is that right? Whatever you want to make out of it. It's up to you. And do you share this? It's your crossword puzzle. And do you share this lack of engagement yourself? What, being apathetic? Yeah. Sure. And there is this image that he, that, that he somehow he just sort of happened to have fame thrust upon him, but there was an element of planning there, wasn't there? Absolutely, and that's the greatest fallacy, that somehow Kurt was grabbed, you know, and he, and he, he played this up himself. As if, the image that Kurt played was as if some, you know, authorities went and ripped him out of his apartment and put him on stage at the Reading Festival. That didn't happen. All along, Kurt made choices, but every choice he made along the road was towards more fame. He could have said, no, I won't sign with a major label. No, I won't play this festival. And at every single choice, he said, yes, I will do those things, because he wanted fame and success. It did all seem to change with that song? Which song do you mean? Smells Like Teen Spirit. Oh, that song, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, how about that? More than a feeling with the lyrics changed. Kurt grew to loathe the song that made him famous, often refusing to play it at Nirvana's gigs. Bring your friends, it's fun to lose. In a commercial sense, I think it's a really good record, I have to admit that, you know, but but that's in a cheap trick way, you know. But, you know, as far as for my personal listen, listening pleasure, you know, it's, it's just too slick. It was covered by Tori Amos, Weird Al Yankovic, and King of the Swing, Paul Anker. With the lights out, less dangerous, here we are now. I feel stupid, contagious. On Easter Sunday, photographer Charles Peterson met Kurt Cobain in the Capitol Hill district of Seattle. The last time I saw Kurt was on the street at Capitol Hill, outside of Linda's Tavern. He wasn't looking so good, but it was nice to see him. He gave me his new phone number, and I think he was out looking to score, I'm sure. So, uh, on a couple different occasions, Courtney was like, ah, oh, you call Kurt, he doesn't have any friends, you know? I was like, well, yeah, of course he doesn't have any friends, because he's doing, like, $500 for the day, a day worth of heroin, you know? I mean, it's hard to... That's your world. Your world isn't socializing with other people unless they happen to be drug dealers or, you know, participating in that, that world themselves. On August the 18th, 1992, Courtney Love gave birth to a baby girl called Frances Bean. Kurt described it as a turning point in his life. He actually felt happy. So I've been married and I've had a child, you know, since within the last year. My whole mental state and my, my physical state has been just almost improved 100%. I haven't felt this optimistic since my parents' divorce, you know. <laughs> With his newfound optimism, Kurt wanted to call Nirvana's next album, I Hate Myself and Want to Die. It was intended ironically, as this was a record he was finally pleased with. I'm really, I'm more proud of this record than anything we've ever done. We finally achieved the, the sound that, we, that I've been hearing in my head forever. When I first encountered in utero, it was because Courtney called me up on the phone, you know, as it was her once at like three in the morning, kind of going, Jerry, you've got you to gotta hear this album, you've got to hear this album, it's amazing. And so they sent me a tape, um, which were just the rough mixes, and it was absolutely incredible. Um, I swear it would have changed the course of popular music in America if it had been released the way it sounded to me then. But Kurt's record company hated it. Why do you think Kurt did compromise? Well, he got fed up of arguing because everybody but everybody was telling him he was wrong. 
you know, in the end, you just get fed up, don't you? You know, whether you believe you're right or wrong, if people are just telling you you're on the whole time, it's like, in the end, you just give up. After seeing Charles Peterson on Capitol Hill, there was one of the more bizarre sightings of Kurt. Two days before he kills himself, he is out with friends at his local Mexican restaurant. I remember I came to dinner with my friend and a group of three or four um, folks came and sat outside. And my friend Joanne and I were just, just thought it was very peculiar. They were choosing to go to a movie. Uh, they had dinner. They started out with dessert, um, which was a bit odd in my opinion, but uh, apparently if you're doing heroin, you're into, into uh, sweet things. Kurt was in good spirits. He enjoyed his banana pudding sautéed in brown sugar and rum, asked the owner for the movie listings, and he and his friends decided on the film The Piano. They left for the cinema. And the waiter went to run his credit card with, when they were done with their bill, when they were getting ready to go to the movie, and his credit card was declined, and the waiter asked me to go talk to him. It was actually right at this table where he was, he needed to write a check, but he just clearly was very out of it because it was so hard for him. Where, where you would write the name of the restaurant, he wrote the dollar amount and it was just kind of gibberish, but it was acceptable and that was the last time I saw him was that Sunday night. And so you wish you kept that check? I do wish I had kept that check. I tried uh, to get it back from the bank, but it had already gone through the system. The next day, the day before he kills himself, Kurt Cobain was still apparently in good spirits. That is according to Katya, who apparently met him on that Monday the 4th. This meeting is the only one not on public record and is the first time Katya has spoken about her encounter. And going back to that meeting with Kurt, where, where did you meet up with him? In front of his house. I mean, you met up with him just a couple of days before, before he died. Before he died, yeah. And we pulled up, and he came out, and he, this is the first time I had met him at all. And he seemed very excited, and he seemed really happy. He seemed up. According to Katya, she and an influential friend of hers from the music scene picked Kurt up from outside his house that evening. I was sitting in the back seat. He, we were kind of looking at each other. I was, like, trying to... <laughs> you know, like, this is no big deal, but it was pretty exciting. And I think it was exciting for him, too. He enjoyed your company? Yeah. And the things you remember most from that meeting was that he... The luminosity. Just the luminosity and the, uh, the sparks that were coming off of him. What do you mean? I mean, could you see actual sparks? Yes, it, 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 there's a, there was a luminosity to him. And sparks? Yes. Yes. It was really beautiful. But you probably know the story about how he played in one of his last concerts to about 40,000 fans. And then he and Courtney fell, uh, flew on to Los Angeles and he eventually disappeared. Well, Courtney hired investigators to try to track him down, including investigators here in Seattle. And they found out that yes, he was here in Seattle, but they were always one step behind him. But what they also found out is he was using drugs that were not his normal customary drugs. And we're going to go down the street here, and I'm going to find a place to park, and we're going to get out, and I'm going to show you where Kurt and Courtney lived. At the beginning of 1994, Kurt bought a three-story, five-fireplace, five-bedroom house in the Lake Washington district of Seattle. The house cost $1.3 million and was in one of the most upscale neighborhoods in the Pacific Northwest. Next door to Kurt lived the CEO of Starbucks. I think that there was a struggle, you know, in his personality because um, I don't think he liked all that ostentatious stuff, you know, and I think there was a lot of pressure to be ostentatious because I, I remember like when I saw him after the MTV Live and Loud thing, he was like all excited because he'd gotten new jeans and a new coat from JCPenney's, you know, which is like a budget discount store here. 
and you know that was like exciting to him he wasn't going to go out and buy designer clothes he was happy to have jeans that didn't have holes in them you know and have like a new warm winter coat like that was a big deal to him the new house on Lake Washington seems to have freaked him out as he spent most of his time in the cupboard off the master bedroom playing guitar a lot of guys in bands will live in like one room of like a huge house I've seen it time after time live in like one room and have like a TV and put it on top of the box the cardboard box they bought the TV and and live there for the first year you know and go to 7-eleven and get you know a burrito and come back and not know what to do It's a Monday night, the 4th of April. This is the last time Kurt Cobain will be seen alive. The location, Linda's Tavern, Capitol Hill. I saw him walk in maybe like around 11 or 12 at night. And I just said, oh, hey, Kurt. Come here for my birthday party. And he just kind of looked at me and went, no. But I was like, <laughs> so um, he, didn't, he didn't even go to the bar. He walked uh, straight to the back. Didn't seem like upset about anything. He just kind of normal, just walked to the back. I've heard rumors he got up on the roof or whatever to like contemplate life. And I'm like, yeah, I don't really think there's any roof access. So he seemed neither here nor there, you know. Um, didn't seem upset, didn't seem distant or contemplative, as I've heard people say. Never did actually see him come out again. Victoria is the last person ever to see Kurt alive. There are no further sightings of him after he leaves Linda's bar. On its release in September 1994 in Utero, Nirvana's third album debuted at number one on the Billboard charts. Kurt Cobain was no longer a mere musician. He was now the spokesman for a generation. In some ways, the money and the fame actually, I think, made him feel more hollow because he felt like, oh, if I only become successful, then I'll be a big deal. And he became successful. And then that one thing, the thing he thought would fix him, didn't fix him. He still had the same parents. He still had the same history. He still had the same self-hatred to some degree. And I think he was even more adrift after he became famous because of that. The machine gets too big and it turns into a machine. And I know I witnessed that with guns, and I know Nirvana hit that huge, where it turned into a machine. It was, became unmanageable, and it's overwhelming. Um, and I don't mean to, to put it down. I mean, some musicians might see this and go, oh, yeah, you know, I could only be so, so blessed to have that machine. But um, it's really, all of a sudden, you have no control over your life. What happened to Led Zeppelin in 10 years happened to Nirvana in only two. They were always on the road and in constant demand. A month before his death, Kurt Cobain pulled out halfway through a 38-date tour in Europe. While the rest of the band flew back to Seattle, he headed to Italy. On March the 3rd, 1994, Kurt was found comatose in room 541 of the Excelsior Hotel in Rome. The incident was originally reported as an overdose, but Kurt's wife, Courtney, who was at the hotel, later revealed that he'd been found clutching a suicide note. Two weeks after Rome, Courtney organized an intervention at their house involving friends, band members and representatives from his record company. Kurt reacted angrily and became abusive. From experience, they tried an intervention on me in Seattle when we were in the middle of a tour at my mom's house with my whole family. It is, it is brutal. I, I ran out. It's, it is the worst. It's the worst. And I don't know about Kurt, but I know for me it was uh, very unpleasant. I wasn't ready. And obviously Kurt wasn't ready to ever stop. Speaking from a drug, drug addict's point of view. In that intervention, Courtney Love had given Kurt an ultimatum. If he didn't finally attempt to deal with his heroin problem, then he would risk losing access to his two-year-old daughter, Frances Bean. 
Faced with that very stark choice, he finally agreed to go to Exodus in LA, and on the 30th of March, Harvey Ottinger drove him to the airport, setting in motion the final few days of Kurt Cobain's life. That I see a darkness, and that I see a darkness, and that I see a darkness, and that I see a darkness. Did you know how much I love you? Nobody knows at what point Kurt Cobain actually died. The coroner's report estimated that it was in the 24-hour period from midday on Tuesday, April the 5th. But on that day, Kurt Cobain is still officially listed as a missing person. No one knows where he is. It is only the day after Kurt's death that P.I. Tom Grant swings into action, leaving L.A. for Seattle to search for what he believes to be a very much alive Kurt Cobain. I had been talking on the phone with Courtney's attorney, Rosemary Carroll, and, um, and with Courtney, and decided it'd be best for me to go up there myself. Despite not having a license to operate in Washington, he flew to Seattle to meet up with one of Kurt's friends, Dylan Carlson, to start looking for him. Later that night, Grant and Carlson went to the house at Lake Washington. This is an audio recording of the visit. But crucially, they don't look in the greenhouse, the site where Kurt's body would eventually be found. Tom Grant says he didn't notice the greenhouse, and as a result, Kurt Cobain lies undiscovered for a further two days. You didn't search the greenhouse. No. It's sloppy, isn't it? Well, that part of it, that part of it, I'll tell you. First of all, I was in a hurry to get in there and get out of there because I didn't want him showing up while we were there. But I agree. And my first response when we found out that he was up in that greenhouse both times we were there, I was embarrassed because I blew it and the, the electrician found the body and I didn't. Well, I got a phone call from uh, our electrician, Gary Smith, and he was doing some uh, uh, security lighting at a house of a, we just knew it was a rock star in Seattle. We weren't sure. Didn't know who he was. I mean, he literally just kind of stumbled across it. He was putting up security lighting, and he looked through a doorway, a glass door, a locked door, and um, he saw a body, and he got on the phone and called me. He glanced down on the floor, and I saw something that looked like a mannequin. So uh, I, then I take a double take, and I can see blood in this ear and long hair and wristwatch. And... He asked me what Kurt Cobain looked like. And I had no idea, so I asked my uh, administrative assistant, and she described him as long, blondish hair, fairly thin, and I told Gary that on the phone, and he said, yeah, that's him. He, I think he shot himself. So I called a radio station and told him what happened. So I answered the, the call, and there's a guy on the line. He's going, I, I have got some incredible news here. Uh, Kurt Cobain is dead. And we were, you know, it was a hectic morning show, and we don't... I don't have time for this, hung up on him. But because he was so uh, emphatic, we thought we'd call the Seattle Police Department and we said, by chance, have you gotten a report of anything going on at the home of Kurt Cobain? And they said, yeah, there's a report of a body there, but that's all we can tell you right now. The uh, French doors were locked from the outside, so I kicked the door in and uh, a pane of glass actually and reached in and opened the door and, and uh, then we walked in to check the patient. It was a fairly barren room and he was uh, lying probably two-thirds, three-quarters of the way down the room, slightly to the right, all, you know, sort of like the center of the floor, off to one side a little bit, uh, laying on his back, head to the left side, and uh, there was a, what looked to be a shotgun kind of in his lap. Did you have any idea who he was? I didn't. 
We need to confirm identification. We need to notify uh, family. And then we need to perform an autopsy. Until those uh, various phases of the investigation are complete, anything that's, uh, that you know right now is somewhat preliminary with nothing uh, uh, definitive at this time. Kurt Cobain, the lead singer of the enormously popular rock band Nirvana, is dead. Apparently, he was a suicide at the age of 27. Can you remember what you were doing when you heard that he was dead? I was at home, and I don't remember what I was doing. I know it was, uh, you know, it was a weekday, but uh, I think I, I think Alice called me first and told me my friend Alice Wheeler and told me that she'd heard it on uh, the radio station. The end, and then and then I think Shelley called me and told me. And were you surprised that it was suicide? I was very surprised. I mean, I know that uh, I know that he'd had problems, like he was fighting with Chris and fighting with with um, Dave, and there was a big you know, contention about him doing drugs and, and about Courtney and everything, but I really didn't think he committed suicide. I actually woke up that morning thinking that I should call Kurt, um, and I looked at my watch and it was like 10.30, and I was like, nah, it's way too early for that guy. And then the phone rang, and it was actually Rolling Stone looking for photographs, and it was like, they were like, yeah, he's Kurt. Kurt Cobain's, I'm like, oh, God. I turned on the radio, and there it was. They were talking about it. It was just like, the first thing I think I remember hearing was, nothing has been confirmed yet, but a body has been found. It was weird. It was like, it's almost like I didn't hear it at all. I was like, oh, yeah, you know, is dead. And I was like, who? You know, you know, you know, Kurt Cobain. I don't know that guy. I got a call um, from LA, and it's from the airport in LA, and it's Eric Erlandson, who's with Courtney, her guitarist, who's a very good friend of mine, um, saying that Courtney wants you to come to Seattle. Um, I was like, oh, great. <laughs> so, got to the house, Courtney showed me Mark the suicide note. I didn't particularly want to see it, to be honest. And it wasn't addressed to me. On Sunday the 10th of April, a public candlelight vigil was held in Seattle. 10,000 people turned up carrying candles and flowers. A recording of Courtney Love reading out Kurt's suicide note was played over a PA system. The fact is, I can't fool you, any one of you. It simply isn't fair to you or to me. The worst crime I could think of would be to pull people off by faking it, pretending as if I'm having 100% fun. At the age of 27, Kurt Cobain committed suicide, leaving behind his wife, his two-year-old daughter, and millions of devotees suddenly left without their leader. Here was a drama in which a great man shouldered the burden of a blundering and ignorant people, suffered for them, and was destroyed at the height of his success. In death, the myth-making began, and Cobain's life was invested with a spiritual symbolism. Brandt is a member of the Church of Kurt Cobain, one of its disciples. Two nights before Kurt's death, he had a dream. Well... As strange as it sounds, I had, uh, I believe it was probably about a couple, a couple nights beforehand, uh, I had a dream. I had this strange dream. I didn't really understand when it, when I had it. I was, I was, I was in a white room, and it was just like, it was like the, you know, it was almost like the walls were glowing, but it was just a white room. I remember just sitting there, and I remember Kurt Col came and told me he was going to pass the torch to me, and it was one day you as a person, you as a musician, you as an artist will achieve everything you've always wanted to achieve and more. And now I'm, you know, 27 years old, standing on the property where he was 27 years old, where he died. And it's kind of strange that everything in this year is coming, things are coming to pass, like that some things that we discussed about and some things that were spoken a little bit later on, you know, that perhaps that this year at 27 years old, I can maybe pick up that torch and go. Katja also had a visitation from Kurt. 
about a week and a half after he died, he came to me in a dream. And he showed me a very violent scenario where he had, was partying with a couple of people and things had gotten out of hand. And, uh, and he was getting sassy with them. They wanted him to do something. They were trying to push it. It went too far. And it went so far that they had to finish it off rather than, you know, end up in the news. And who do you think murdered him then? Um, you know what, I'm not really going to say that because it's kind of scary for me in a way, you know, to okay, see sure. that much. Now, there are a lot of people here in town, especially Seattle, that don't believe that it was a suicide. The reason why I say that is his suicide note had two different forms of handwriting. Um, his autopsy showed he was full of drugs, enough to kill a horse. He didn't need a shotgun on top of that. So you add it all up and it makes plausible cause. Personally, as I told my friend, I can't understand why anybody would want to kill him or or him dying. I really can't understand that at all. But he killed himself. Uh, that is what they say. But there are other rumors that things did happen. Like that, what? That somebody did kill him. Were you surprised it was a suicide? No. I mean, it's shocking. Absolutely shocking. Anything like that's going to be shocking. But was I... I didn't fall out of my chair in, in surprise. Um, it's not like the guy was jumping around for joy the night before. The couple of times I had met him after they became successful, he had reeked of suicide in a way. Um, it was obvious that there was something very wrong. There was something that he was really, really, really not enjoying and he wasn't saying what it was. And then the thing that scared the daylights out of me was seeing the heart-shaped box video on television. Because if you know Kurt and you see him in that video, it's really quite scary. I don't think he's acting. Did you go to the funeral? I did. It was hard. It was kind of weird. There was like a, you know, a lot of people there. Uh, besides from family and stuff, people I didn't know. It seemed kind of strange. It, I always kept on thinking I shouldn't be here for some reason. I don't know why I felt that. It just seemed kind of strange, so. I came and I sat in the back. Some people would come up to me and asked if I wanted to join them up front, but I was like, no. And it was a pretty, uh, it's pretty, you know, pretty quiet. After the funeral, we went to the wake there, and there was like one old couch in the living room. It was probably like maybe from the 20s or the 30s, but it was kind of in bad shape. It wasn't like a fancy antique. There was like a really crappy bookshelf, and there was like sheets pinned up over the windows. I got this chair that came out of Kirk Cobain's house. It was taken out of the home by a realtor who I knew, and for a hundred bucks I bought it. It's disgusting, it's filthy, it's, it's got cigarette burns, it's, it's horrible, actually. But it is Kurt Cobain's chair. In death he became even greater, and is now the highest earning dead celebrity in the world, outgrossing even Elvis. I put it on eBay. I'm not thinking anybody would bid on it. And I got these outrageous bids. And what's even stranger was is I, I start getting outrageous mail, email. People that were angry, people that were, were telling me that I, I couldn't say anything that disrespected Kurt Cobain. 
The bidding got up to $17,000, but Bill got scared by the threatening emails from Nirvana fans and withdrew the chair. It seems as though this some, somehow represents sort of a shrine to a lot of people out there. Over a decade after his grandson's death, Leyland Cobain's trailer in Aberdeen is still a mecca for fans around the world. This is the, this is the second, third bag full like this that I've had that I've thrown away. These are all letters from all over the world. So, so Kurt's fans, they come from around the world and they, they come and stay with you? Oh yeah, I tell them they can come there, then I can show them around uh, where Kurt lived here in Monty and uh, the school where Kurt went to school in Monty and in and, and Aberdeen. And I don't know, they sort of figure me with Kurt, I guess, because I'm Kurt's grandfather and uh, they just sort of start in. They, some of them have seen my name, some of them are recent, some of them have been there quite a while. And what kind of things do people ask you when they come and visit or write to you? Oh about Kurt, uh, what he was like or that, and and it, to me, he was just like any other kid. Uh, he could be honorary or he could be good, but most of the time he was pretty good. Sometimes you, you choose to take permanent solution to a temporary problem and I'm thinking that's where he was I you know there's all these things abound and that uh, you know he was off by a drug dealer or he was this or that I think because he my own my own idea is that he was just unhappy and he wanted out he wanted out and I've been there once in my life I've I had a gun barrel locked and loaded in my mouth and I know what it tastes like but it makes sense well, if you think about it, like we went out for almost three years, and in about roughly the same period of time, three years, he became a rock star, got married, had a kid, um, and committed su and became a heroin addict and committed suicide, in the same time frame. You know, that's that's a lot of pressure to happen in, in three years. This candle was the actual candle that was at the vigil. When I held this candle, I started thinking about all the beautiful things that Kurt Cobain did when he was in the Nirvana band. He was so young, and so many people didn't understand why he died. Yeah. Here it goes. It's there, going now. It's better now. It's going to go again. Let's try one more time. There. But as this candle goes out, we just like to say, uh, lit or not lit, the, the spirit is there, just like a God that you may know, whatever you see him is at. Whether it doesn't have to be lit, it can still be burning in your heart and your feelings. My life is starting over again, over again, my friends. Say I'm back again. My life is starting over again, over again. My fame. Across the land